Radyasyonun yeryüzünü tarıyor Senin akıbetin belli mi dünya 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 Hello everyone This is CM Kozeman Back with a Q&A session From a certain friend named Marco Fraga da Silva. He is a great comic artist. He writes for a comic which you can... Uh, he writes or draws or both for a comic which you can read at chroniclesoftimeandspace.com. The link is below the video description. And he is a PhD candidate. Now, every day I get many questions that people want me to answer on this channel. Most of them, I kindly have to turn them down because I seriously, I'm nearing 35,000 subscribers now. And if I answered them all, I wouldn't have time to do anything else. But for Marco, I'm doing an exception because he's you going to use these questions for a PhD project. So, you know, and his questions are really insightful, really revealing and they really have a broad area and I think we will all enjoy listening to the answers so I've chosen to answer these questions some of your questions those of you know themselves I cannot answer this is due to a lack of time please don't take it personally speaking of questions and answers if you really like what I'm doing with this website please consider supporting me on patreon.com the link is in the video description. It's the first thing you see in the video description. And you know, these days, I know every penny counts. Every penny counts for me too. Thanks to your gracious donations, I can sing amazing songs like the one you just heard in the beginning of this video. So please donate to me on Patreon. And our number two rule is at CM Kozeman Bar is to listen to these podcasts at twice or 1.5 times the speed because you know makes me sound like a cooler dude anyways here we go with Marco's questions take a bit of chamomile tea last day I saw a pet store ad for micro bullies and if you don't know what these are these are these like pit bull hybrids that are just so small, so deformed. They have like these splaying legs. They look like these primitive mammal-like reptiles or some shit. And they're just so derpy. And I have to confess, adorable. And the best thing is the people who breed these micro bullies prepare posters for each micro bully they breed. So they make them all look like legendary or these like deformed weird dogs look like Fast and Furious posters. It's just amazing. So the whole week I spent driving my wife crazy because I was always tripping on this micro bully ASMR action. You know, I would go up to her and say, micro bully. And it's just <laughs> hilarious. Anyways, I had to get this off my chest. So let's go with Marco Fraga da Silva's questions. He says, when visiting your website, you have many multimedia abilities. Thank, thanks, man. I do my best. I paint, you illustrate, you write books and articles. You have a photography account. You have a YouTube channel. And then he says, these are all areas that can complement and nourish your creative necessities. What is your favorite media and why? Well, my favorite medium would have to be painting, real life painting with actual paint, watercolors, pencil. I'm, I'm lucky enough to do a whole lot of other things, but these, you know, you just need some piece of scrap paper. I have painted on paper I've scavenged from the trash or during the worst of the COVID lockdowns, I was recycling uh, cardboard from uh, pasta packages, ma mac and cheese packages, I don't know, 
like these packages, they've got this kind of white underside, which is really absorbent to paint and watercolors, and they don't wrinkle. So you could even paint on that stuff. And, you know, heaven forbid if I find myself abandoned somewhere or in a jail or something, I would just have a pen, some paper, I'd be set for life. I mean, this, I believe, is a, figuratively speaking, God-given gift or disease that I'm afflicted with. Uh, I could just paint, draw, create my worlds and be a happy person. So my favorite media is paint, real life paint. Digital stuff, AI stuff, they're really cool, but you know, you have to, have to, have to learn how to draw and paint with real life stuff. And then it kind of gives you a perspective on how to use all the other digital stuff. Anyways, another question from Marco is, how do you use writing as a d device to explore your artistic drive and goals? Okay, so I've been also writing books on the side and most of these books, one day I should do an intro video introducing all my real life books. Most of these books are straight up books of historic research or visual history research. Like one of them is about this these illustrated tombstones on a particular part of Istanbul belonging to a very esoteric religion. Very nice stuff. My latest book was about three illustrations in village cemeteries in rural western Turkey. So these are like academic books, you know, they're not page turners. They're very well illustrated, but I don't expect anyone to buy them to like read on a coffee table or something though they look quite good as coffee table books but uh, the gist of the matter is they're not bestsellers but they advance the information reservoir of humankind even by a little little drop they are all original and first time researchers on any of the areas they pertain to and I'm quietly humbly very proud of them they've been purchased by libraries of almost all Ivy League schools, national archives. Heck, if you go, if you're an American friend, go to the Library of Congress, go to librarian and say, librarian, hit me up with C.M. Kozeman. Believe me, you will find several books that I wrote in the Library of Congress. How cool is that? And if you do this, please let me know in the comments. It will be just a nice memory. Writing, well, you need to re read 100 books at least in order to write one good paragraph. It's deceptively easy, but actually it's extremely hard. Every month I go back and look at the things I wrote in the previous month and they all look like crap. I mean, it's very, very hard to micro bullies. It's very hard to write logically expositing an idea, laying it out, defining a paragraph. These things are very hard. Writing clearly is also very hard. Like, what do you want to write? For example, imagine you're walking in the street and someone throws a micro bully out of the window and it lands on your car and smashes your front window. Okay, how will you tell this story? Do you start by telling what a weird thing happened? Do you start start by telling what a micro bully is? Do you start by telling how much you paid for the damages to your car? Also, you have to keep in mind that, especially if you're writing a book, that almost anyone will be able to read it in the distant future. I mean, forget online stuff, you know, Books really last long. You can find books from a hundred years ago and read them. And you can see that in those cases, some of the context erodes that you don't know what these people are talking about. So you have to write, at least if you're writing for like a history book or generally, if you want to be a good writer, you have to lay your thoughts out in such a way that somebody 
who doesn't know anything about the subject. I always use the abuelita method for this thing. Abuelita is this kind of Spanish word for like this big sister or an auntie or you know like this lady who's kind of clueless. So you have to write in a way that even if you're writing about the mo most esoteric creature or the weirdest historical facts or the strangest micro bully, someone who is like like your great aunt or an abuelita should be able to understand this, what's going on. So going back to our micro bully through the windshield scenario, how do you tell this story? I mean, personally, I would start by telling I had a horrible car accident. I was driving and something fell through the window. It was a tiny dog. And then you explain what a micro bully is. And then you explain how you paid for the damages and how the micro bully was not hurt because those things are rock hard. Anyways, that was a like in joke, but I hope I could get it across. And also when writing, I always find I make lots of typos, repeat words. And of course, I'm writing on a computer. So it's like a curse. So recently, I'm revamping some of my older science fiction books you probably know all tomorrows and stuff so when i'm rewriting all tomorrows i don't write on a computer i have just pieces of paper and a pen it's a bit like eminem here's a pen here's a pencil go home write something suspenseful write something suspenseful okay because when you're writing just pen to paper you concentrate with a computer I have a horrible attention span. I, I meander all over the place. Every every five minutes I turn on Facebook or some shit. I get distracted a lot. So it's very important to identify that the human mind is an untamable piece of shit beast. It's like a micro bully that you have to like beat with a stick and train. So limit the possibilities and you refine the output when writing that's like I'm not being romantic about it you make less typos when you write on paper you correct things on the fly and then you do a second pass typing it on the computer and then when you do that second pass you really refine your stuff and it's really convenient that way oh so I hope this was a good answer R then another question from Marco Ray Kurzweil believes that after 2045, technological singularity will take place. So technology will advance so fast that every day we will be like techno gods compared to the previous day. And then Marco's questions com question continues. You were not afraid to tackle such an important question, what the future will look like. Why did you have the desire to create the narrative in All Tomorrows? Okay, this book. Okay, let's break this down. And then also Marco asks, was, was one of your inspirations this book called Last and First Man by Olaf Stapledon? That's O-L-A-F-S-T-A-P-L-E-D-O-N. Of course, it was an inspiration. So let's break this down. Ray Kurzweil believes that after 2045, to this particular person, I can only say, say that Ray Kurzweil believes. His predictions are as millenarian and as crazy and as divorced from reality as any religious or cult text, in my personal opinion. Heck, open that amazing book by St. John of Patmos, Apocalypse, what was it called? You know, the crazy Old Testament or New Testament, crazy Bible story about the end of the days. That's a more healthy prediction than any shit these technological utopian people can come up with. Ray Kurzweil believes. His thing is a belief. He shows, in my personal humble opinion, the most perverted, feeble, and 
how how should I put it lightly? Self-centered aspects of the techno scientific civilization that developed and festered, dare I say, in the Western world. Technology is great in most cases, it is advancing, obviously we can see that. But if you look at anything Ray Kurzweil writes, what you see underneath all of that gobbledygook is this horrible childlike fear of dying. Basically he says we will all upload our minds into an AI and become immortal. Heck, if I can beat cancer until 2045, it used to be 2025, 20, I think. Now the goals have been revised. I'll be immortal. You just can't not die. It's like the impossibility of dying in the mind of someone living. And he uses that all of these technological vocabulary. I'll give him some credit. He's probably competent more competent than most others on the technological issues he's talking about but if you look at the big picture the big picture Kurzweil or people like him paint is a festering manifestation of the worst aspects generated by western civilizations technological superiority it's just if we tech hard enough if we tech bro innovate hard enough disrupt hard enough we won't die. Ha! <laughs> what a paradox. What a what a cheap, cheap, belligerent lie. Don't don't take any truck from people like this, believe me. I mean death is really painful, it's really dark, but we all have to face with it. And then sure you can enjoy technological advances. I'm not being a Luddite, by the way. But to have this kind of world belief in that we will be liberated from death. It's not going to happen in the next century, next thousand years. I don't know. Telomere extensions. I don't know. Ah, you do that, something else will come along. What a, what a pitiful, arrogant coward. Anyways, hope you enjoyed this rant. So anyways, when I was writing, let's tackle the second part of the question because Marco asks, why did you have the desire to create the narrative for all tomorrows? Basically, okay, All Tomorrows, if you don't know what it is, it's an ebook I wrote in 2005 or 4, I don't even remember, about the future evolution of the human species. Now, behind the scenes, this was an, just an excuse to draw as many weird human-like creatures, post-human things, as, as much as I could. So there were like high-gravity people, they were really tall. There were low gravity people, there were really squat, there were fish people, bird people, shit people, I kid you not. Read the book. So I needed to make some sort of narrative to, you know, because I had all these cool pictures of post-humans. Let's have some story to tie them all together. So in fact the story came about as an excuse, as a blatant excuse, to connect all these threads, all this artwork together. And I did not indulge in any kind of future predictions in fact i will say it out loud now that all tomorrows is probably the worst prediction of the future many of the things i wrote about in that book will probably never happen we will never go to outer planets we will probably never even colonize mars it's like technically extremely difficult without this you can't do that without destroying this world first and we come back to Ray Kurzweil, technology, technology will take us somewhere, may not be such a great place. Heck, maybe some of those undeveloped nations or these like, like what these right-wing racists like to call undeveloped peoples, actually they're onto something, you know. Maybe if you live a little bad, you know, if your life is not great, then your species actually lasts longer. Heck, maybe your planet even lasts longer. So, I hope that was a good answer. You know, we went a little sideways there, but no, I wanted to say this for a long time. So, thanks for giving me the opportunity. And of course, Last and First Man by Olaf Stapledon was a great inspiration. If you like All Tomorrows, you're going to love Last and First Man. I was blatantly inspired by this book to the degree of copying it in certain parts. 
So, you know, I am but a mere insect compared to the genius of Olaf Staplidon's work. Okay, another three questions actually about the world of dinosauroids I created with Simon Roy. He says it's an amazing example of world building. Thank you. Now, this is a project I'm much more proud about compared to All Tomorrows. Like you all liked All Tomorrows, so I'm revamping and rewriting it. But you know, this one about dinosauroids, basically it's an answer to this question, what if dinosaurs could evolve into an intelligent species like people? How would they live? What would their world look like? And you know, how would their civilization develop? So Simon Roy, really great comic artist and a close friend, and I, in the early 2010s, we collaborated on this project, drawing lots of dinosauroids, dinosauroid cave art, and all the weird creatures that lived like them. And one of our ideas was to, you know, when people go on these speculative evolution projects, and it's about, let's say, a world in which dinosaurs never died out, then you... And they have all the old dinosaurs again, as if nothing could change in 65 million years. But in this world, we had these like furry, shaggy, stinky dinosaur bird things. But we also had a lot of furry, shaggy, stinky mammal things. These like marsupials that still evolved even without the asteroid impact that killed the dinosaurs. But they evolve into strange antelope-like forms, but you could still see they're kind of like not this world's ungulates, but they are something else. So that was the premise, and a lot of the credit in this project goes to Simon Roy. His artwork is amazing. Go look Dinosauroids, Simon Roy and Kozaman. You'll find this project. It's in my website if you go to cmkozaman.com. And we just passed ideas back and forth, emailed, and in fact, we did have a plan to make this into like a proper book, you know, a young adult's storybook. There would be this tribe of dinosauroids, an artist, a lady friend, and a kind of chunky sidekick dinosauroid. Their nest would be raided by these slaver dinosauroids, and they would be taken on this big quest across the present-day Middle East and the Levant and they would see all these weird creatures, cultures and civilizations. But then somewhere along the way we realized, you know, why, why are we pushing the story? It's better, more fun and in fact more readable just to design the world itself. And then any stories the reader will generate in that world would be thousands of times more entertaining and wholesome than any forced story we might be able to conjure. So this this project, as far as I'm concerned, is done. If we expand it, it would only be with Simon Roy's uh, grace and permission. And if we expand it, as far as I'm concerned, it will never become a storybook. It will just be more creatures, like basically more episodes to a documentary. And then another question about the world of dinosauroids. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Are you envisioning a transmedia storytelling strategy for the world of the dinosauroids? I already gave the answer to this. Sadly, no. And then another question. Speculative zoology is very present in your body of works. Thank you. What are your main references and inspirations? Okay, for speculative zoology. You have to read anything written or look at everything painted by Wayne Douglas Barlow. He is like the great god of all speculative zoology or evolution. He has a series called Expedition. He has a book called Expedition in which he details life on an alien planet. And I was extremely inspired when I read this book as a kid. Then he has a book called Barlow's Guide to Extraterrestrials, which is also unbelievable. And he's got a whole lot of things. So I think Wayne Barlow is one lesson. Another lesson comes from Olaf Staplidon, 
the great author I mentioned earlier. Then, of course, there are these works by Dougal Dixon. That's D-O-U-G-A-L-A-L-D-I-X-O-N. He has a story called Afterman, in which humanity goes extinct and life forms evolve to replace all the damage we've done to the planet. And then he's got another book called The New Dinosaurs, tackling that old question, what if the dinosaurs never died out? And then he's got another book called Man After Man, which is not as great as the others. It's about future evolution of humans, like all tomorrows. But it's a weird, weird book. I don't know. So these three names, Stepley, Don, Barlow, Dixon, they should be your primers. And then the, there are some amazing projects out there today. Serina, S-E-R-I-N-A. It's a great project. It's about this world populated only by canaries and guppy fish. And then they evolve into the wildest, most creative, no, most beautifully illustrated animals you will see in any medium of storytelling. It's by Dylan Badaja or D Dylan Badja. Forgot how to spell his last name. But D Y L A N Serina S E R I N A. You know, hope one day. I will be able to make something as compelling and beautiful as that project. It's unbelievable. Then immerse yourself in the community. Look, there are many other big projects online. There was one project in the early 2000s called the Spec World Project. It's about a scientifically accurate, for its time, view of the world had the dinosaurs not gotten extinct. It was a big collaborative effort by many artists and writers and proper paleontologists. And it's just great. It's a pity it's not fully online in the day and age, but it really inspired me. And it should inspire you too. Spec World, that's S-P-E-C World Dinosaurs. Just Google it. It's hard to find, but it's well worth it. There are many online resources, communities, and go immerse yourself in them all and finally something will develop in your mind as well. Just have fun, that's it. And sometimes it's better to pursue the creature's forms rather than writing a story for them. Or sometimes you don't have to have like a big project. You know, if you like an image of, let's say, a whale that lives on a planet uh, imagine it's the far future okay and for some reason the world's oceans have zones that are 20,000 meters deep or something imagine the whales that are evolved to dive that deep you know how would they adapt with this compressed eyes or like weird armored body who knows now if that concept is appealing to you just draw the whales man don't need to create the whole world just one drawing is enough sometimes. And then just develop your art style, develop your storytelling style. The good thing about speculative evolution is that if you're good at it, you become a good writer, a good scientist, a good researcher, and a good artist. It's a Swiss army knife of esoteric artistic traits, let's say. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Hope this was a good answer. Another question. If you could define world building, how would you address such a task? Okay, this is a big question. And I'm going to try an answer now. But it may not be enough because I need, think, I need to think for a long time before coming up with a reasonable answer. I think... Any piece of writing or art which is internally self-consistent and which aims to develop primarily lore rather than characters or a story, although for some proper stories you have also amazing world building, like uh, some of the films by Ridley Scott, the alien, first alien movie in 1979, the original Blade Runner, 
Now, these are all great examples of world building, but these are also all great examples of narrative story. But I say something that sets speculative fiction aside or world building aside is that you don't necessarily have to have a story there. I mean, if you have one, that's even better. But the primary focus is on creating the world. So I hope this helps. And then one final question. Recent findings in archaeology and paleontology are revolutionizing the world. What are the recent main events and discoveries that have galvanized your imagination? Well, the first and foremost among these would have to be the creation of micro bullies. Man, those things are great. I just think they're neat. Anyways, that's a joke. But jokes aside, I was really inspired by the Prehistoric Planet series, which came about in early June 2022, narrated by David Attenborough, music by Hans Zimmer, and finally, a 100% accurate dinosaur documentary administered by proper paleontologists and it wasn't afraid to show dinosaurs as cute or derpy or weird animals because animals are cute and weird or disgusting and derpy yes they are also sometimes majestic and ferocious but the operative word here is that they are majestic and ferocious too nature cannot be shoehorned into pure wilderness or pure cuteness and this was also beautifully animated the creatures were awesomely designed I could not find anything to criticize in this series prehistoric planet it really inspired me perhaps one critic could be you know it wouldn't be such a bad thing if they acknowledged the book I wrote with my close friend John Conway and whose foreword was authored by Darren Nash, who was also the lead science consultant for Prehistoric Planet. You know, if they had put in one kind word about all yesterdays, because some pictures in all yesterdays look like keyframes for Prehistoric Planet. But I'll leave it here, you know, uh, maybe they were too busy. But it would have been nice, you know, that could have been my only critique. But it was a great show. I'm 100% behind it. You know, if we have to take one for the team, so be it. So this was really galvanizing. You know, after watching Prehistoric Planet, I just drew dinosaurs nonstop. And I, paleo art. You know, I remembered how fun and great it was. So that was one. What are some other... Um, events and discoveries I don't know hmm I mean there are many interesting things happening I mean recently they are discovering more and more of these Cambrian era creatures and you know the Cambrian explosion if you don't know it's this great development in which the main groups of animal life inhabiting earth evolved in like an extremely short time and alongside members of groups we recognize today there were some extremely weird creatures things with five eyes or you know whose mouths closed like camera shutters amazing stuff there are more and more discoveries coming in from those ages now and it looks like these were not freaks of evolution as were, as they were once thought to be but they actually fit congruently within the development of life and you know some of those weird groups could be tangent relatives of today's arthropods or chelicerates so that's an interesting fact that really got my noggin joggin also another big discovery recently comparatively recently they did this big ass dna analysis okay on insects and crustaceans insects obviously okay traditionally scientists thought that there were three great phyla of arthropods one was hexapods containing insects and some other minor groups 
and also millipedes and centipedes. Another one was just crustaceans proper, you know, crabs, prawns, lobsters, stuff like that. And another big phylum was silicarates, containing spiders, scorpions, arachnids, best group, arachnid gang, rise up! So that was a traditional view of things. Then, comparatively recently, scientists did, did, did this amazing overhaul, studying the genomes of all these crustaceans and insects and silicarates, whatever. They revealed that arachnids and silicarates, their parent group, they were really noble, distinct group of arthropods on their own. But turns out, insects, ha, those simps with millions of species, turns out they were not a unique group of their own. In fact, they were, according to genetic DNA analysis, they were part of the arthropods. So the group of insects was nestled within the arthropods themselves. They were just glorified shrimp all along. Ah, so They're just glorified shrimp that, that were lucky, you know, they got to the land early, developed those flip-flop wings early, and then started simping heavily for plants. You know, many insects, especially the more advanced ones like flies or moths or butterflies, their life, tank, life cycles are so entangled with those of plants that, you know, they might even be exchanging DNA back and forth, like a single species of moth is directly tied to a single subspecies of plant or whatever. The extremely extreme simps for plants. Whereas arachnids and silicarates, they were noble. They were not simping for no plant. And they, I mean, if you watched my arachnids giga podcast, you would know that silicarates and arachnids seem to be more individually self-aware. You know, th when they're young, hatch, they come out as miniature copies of their adults and grow a bit like mammalian offspring. Whereas insects, those degenerates, you know, they've got some of the most profane reproductive cycles out there. Most of them don't have no parental care. Their larvae are like these weird alien chest burster things. You know, larva, there's the goes off to eat shit. And then after eating shit for a year, emerges a dainty butterfly. Huh. What a show off. Of course, this is all humor. But the gist of my big, big humorous segment is that it's really amazing to f see this one extremely distinct group turn out to be a part of another group. Not even related, but they're like within crustaceans. Insects are more closely related to crabs than some crustaceans are to crabs themselves. That's amazing. So, this really got me thinking, you know, if we run more such analysis, maybe we'll find more surprises. Things which look similar could be distant relatives. Things which look extremely different could be closely related to some other things. And, you know, if I was to make a prediction, I would bet that maybe we should explore this in another video. But the group of lizards known as geckotans, containing geckos, they're quite different from all other lizards. They lay eggs that are like the eggs of a bird. You know, they have a hard, calcium-rich shell. Whereas most other reptiles, including almost including crocodiles, I believe, even turtles, like all other lizards lay leathery eggs. If you see a lizard egg, it's like a little purse kind of thing. There's an eggshell, but it's soft. If you look at a turtle egg, once again, it doesn't have a hard shell that a bird has. Crocodiles have harder shells, but still they're kind of softish. What I'm getting at, getting at is, wouldn't be surprising if all these geckotans, these gecko lizards, turn out to be not related to proper lizards at all. In fact, maybe there are some dwarf regressive offshoots of the archosaur lineage that led to birds. You know, I'm no genetic scientist, so this is probably a wrong prediction. 
but if it came out to be true, I wouldn't be surprised. So here are my responses to Marco Fraga da Silva's questions. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. I have to go. The door is ringing. See you in a bit. Yeah, so sorry about the fast and rude interruption. There was a knock at the door. Just had to go get it. Turns out it's a man with no face. He showed me a box and he said, Put your hand in this box, mortal. I said, what's in the box? Uh, it was really painful. And he said, micro bullies. <laughs> Anyways, hope you enjoyed this question and answer session. Please, 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 please support me on Patreon.com so I can feed my debilitating addiction for micro bullies and please have a look at marco fraga da silva's website on chronicles of time and space.com and please have a nice day this was cm kozaman goodbye <laughs>